So Evan, what are we looking at here? This is called a pad printer. This machine puts the Seymour Duncan logo or the Baselines logo, if it's one of our base pickups, uh, or any logo that needs to be printed on the pickups. This is a Phase 1 7-string blackouts humbucker. This is um, our, one of our new active uh, humbuckers made for 7-string. And um, you can see it just puts a, a logo using an epoxy-based ink. It takes about 24 hours to cure. And once it's on there, it'll, uh, it'll keep that logo on there and nice and secure. So this looks like a single coil to me. Actually, this is a humbucker bobbin. This is uh, different than the single coil bobbins, which were hand fabricated. This is a bobbin made of a material called polycarbonate. comes out of an injection mold. But like the single coil bobbin, it will serve the same function. It will get wrapped thousands of times with very thin copper wire to create the coil. And then ultimately you put two of them together and the hum gets canceled. Exactly. So all the wire we're looking at back here, is this specific to any different types of pickups or is this used on humbuckers and single coils alike? We use this wire that you see behind us on all the pickups that we make. One of the things you'll notice right away is that there's different colors to the wire. Sure, I see copper and there's something darker. They're actually all copper in terms of the composition of the wire, but the wire has to be insulated. If it wasn't insulated, you have copper touching copper in the coil, and that would create basically one big coil. Instead, this insulation allows us to put thousands of turns, in some cases tens of thousands of turns, sure. of wire on the coil, uh, but the different insulations have different historical purposes and different sounds, and that's why you'll see, for example, uh, this is called heavy form var, and it was used on the original Fender pickups. This is called plain enamel, and it was used on the original Gibson patent applied for type of pickups. You'll also see numbers, 42 here, 43 here, 44. Those are the gauges or the diameter of the wire. It's the same as a speaker cable, for instance. The higher the number, the thinner the wire. Sure. And some pickups you, th you hear about, like uh, vintage wire being, what, a 43 gauge? 42 gauge. 42 is the most common gauge that we use for pickup manufacturer. Uh, but if we want to get more DC resistance or more turns on a bobbin, we'll go to a higher number like 43 or even 44. Okay. Well, taking the magnet out of the equation for right now, the general rule with winds of uh, copper wire and the number of turns is this. The more turns or the thinner the wire, the higher the DC resistance. That's the resistance to DC uh, current. Uh, the higher DC resistance is going to give you more output and more strength from the pickup, but you pay a price for that strength. You lose high end, and the resonant peak shifts from higher frequencies to lower frequencies. So basically, there's a trade off. If you want more output, you wind a hotter pickup, but you lose treble response when you do that. Which ultimately translates to clarity and detail. Exactly. So, Brett, you were you telling me that you like the Seth Lover pickup, and it's got kind of a slightly honky microphonic sound and a, a certain tonality. This is a weird thing. This is not the bobbin for a Seth Lover pickup. This is a, a, a different bobbin. The way I know it's different is by the smell. Smell it. No smell. No smell. This is butyrate plastic, and this is what we use on the Seth Lover pickup. Smell it. It's oh, got a freaky. slightly sour yeah. milk kind of smell to it. Oh, that's weird. Now, here's the weird thing. You don't actually see these, these bobbins in, uh, in a Seth Lover humbucker because they have covers on them. Right. But just like in the day at Gibson, when uh, if you bought like a 58 or a 59 Les Paul and you pop the covers off the pickups, yeah. you would find different color combinations under the cover. Yeah. Maybe the zebra. black, maybe zebra, whatever. Yeah. So we do the same thing with the Seth Lovers and the Antiquities which means you pop the covers off, maybe you get a zebra, maybe you get a double black. Yeah. You don't know. But what we had to do, because we're using this weird plastic butyrate, is we had to color match the cream butyrate to the same cream that we used for the polycarbonate. And that meant for us, we had to buy a minimum lot of cream butyrate dye. Now, butyrate's weird enough, but cream butyrate meant that with the small usage that we have with cream, cream butyrate bobbins, right. we had to buy 250 years worth of cream butyrate dye. 
So I guess what I'm saying is if any of your readers are looking for a deal on cream butyrate dye, have them come to me. Yeah, or, or we should just start buying more Seth Lovers. Is that your point? Or that. So here's a question, though. Why do you have to use... Um, a different bobbin for the Seth Lover. Or, or am, I, am I hearing this right? Because that's, that's kind of the question that's been going through my head the whole time here. You don't have to. That's the whole point. You don't have to use butyrate. You don't have to hand grind a chamfer on the magnets. You don't have to wind the Seth Lover on the Lisona winder that was used at the Gibson factory in the late 1950s. You don't have to have a wooden spacer in there like the old ones did. But if you're going to make it right, and you're going to do a reproduction pickup exactly the way the old ones were done, then you do have to do it, and that's why we do it. Oh, that's awesome. This is a Lisona Model 102. We got this in 1984 from the Gibson factory when it was uh, moving from Kalamazoo, Michigan, down to Nashville, where it is today. This is the the winding machine that wound the original patent-applied-for pickups. Right now, it's set up with plain enamel wire, and it's winding... 59 neck models. And here's the beauty of it. When you buy a Seymour Duncan 59, you're buying a pickup that was wound on the same winding machine that Gibson was using in 1959 to wind the fabled patent applied for humbuckers that were used on the 59 Les Pauls. One thing that we've done is we've added these digital counters which have automatic stops because back in the day at Gibson, they wound by time and we can actually be more consistent from pickup to pickup by using the digital counters, but it's winding at the same speed, the wire's coming off at the same angle, the traverse is moving back and forth at the same speed, and uh, it's one of the things that you need to do in order to get a PAF replica that sounds right. 59s are wound on this machine, the Seth Lover, the Antiquity Humbucker, the Pearly Gates, the Almaco 2 Pro Humbucker, and our vintage P90 are all wound on the Lisona. So basically anything that lends itself to that vintage style uh, PAF IB pickup, you, you do them here. Here's a question. When you think back about, um, you, you were talking about these timers and how you can get more accurate. Um, you always hear stories about like old PAFs and like finding the cool ones versus the duds. And it always came down to a story about like, hey, maybe the guy walked away from the machine and that's right. If you walked away from the machine to get a cup of coffee or to discuss what was on I Love Lucy last night or whatnot, you could actually get a couple hundred or maybe even a thousand more turns on the bobbin. Well, more turns is going to be higher DC resistance. It's going to get more output, but you're going to lose some of your treble response. But in any event, you're going to change the tonality of that pickup compared to the same pickup if it didn't have the extra hundred or thousand turns on it. But at the end of the day, would it be fair to say that uh, PAFs from that era, the originals, uh, there were a lot of inconsistencies from pickup to pickup? We can get far more consistency from pickup to pickup by using uh, machinery like this that has counters with an automatic shutoff. So rather than having one PAF that can be all over the place, we have several PAF replicas like the 59 and the Seth Lover and the Pearly Gates and the Antiquity, and they all have slightly different DC resistance, and they'll represent that range of moderate PAFs to higher output PAFs. So those are all variations on that 59 theme. So if you dig a hotter PAF, you're going to go maybe for that Pearly Gates as opposed to the Seth Lover. That's right. I mean, the Pearly Gates pickup came from Billy Gibbons' Pearly Gates 59 Les Paul Burst. He happened to have one of those that just had a certain bitey, um, kind of a, a rude Texas tone to it. And Seymour specked out the guitar and the pickup, and that's what our Pearly Gates replica is based on. Okay, and the 59, um, I'm sure there was one, you know, main pickup you guys were looking at that, you know, became the 59. It was a PAF from a 1959 Les Paul Burst. Seymour specced it from top to bottom, and it was one of the particularly good sounding ones. And uh, it was one of our very first pickups. That's why it's the SH-1. And it's still one of our most popular pickups today. And this is the machine that winds it. Well, that's way cool, man.